I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the president of the American Academy, and I want to welcome you to the Richard von Weizsäcker lecture tonight entitled The Origins of Intellectual Property in German Renaissance Art, which will be delivered by Professor Shira Brisman of the University of Pennsylvania. And let me just say how pleased I am that you all came out, despite all of the news that might have prevented you. I, it was just a complete delight to be uh, at the table with so many art historians, so I'm, I'm thrilled we're doing this. <clears throat> uh, the Richard von Weizsäcker Distinguished Visitorship was founded in honor of the former German federal president, who was also a founding member of the American Academy. And as a member of the Bundestag, a mayor of Berlin, and then two-term president, Richard von Weizsäcker was one of the giants of post-war German life and a major figure in the transatlantic relationship. This distinguished visitorship was established in 2007, and it has uh, gone to many outstanding U.S. figures in public life. It was inaugurated by James Wolfenson, the former president of the World Bank, who, as many of you will recall, began life as an Australian but did eventually get American citizenship. Uh, he was the first von Weizsäcker speaker. Uh, subsequent distinguished visitors included Senator Tom Daschle, the former U.S. Senate Majority, Senate Majority Leader, Strobe Talbot, former Deputy Secretary of State and President of the Brookings Institute, where he was uh, my boss, and Fed, Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, uh, among many others. So, Shira, just to reassure you, you don't now need to change careers. This visitorship is not reserved solely for uh, famous uh, individuals from the political world, and in fact, I'm delighted that we have a von Weizsäcker lecturer who is not a former, but a current and future. Uh, others who have delivered this talk include music critic Alex Ross, journalist and historian Francis Fitzgerald, and the distinguished literary critic and theorist Gayatri Spivak. Well, that brings me to Shira Brisman herself, though still earlier, early in her career, Shira Brisman has put a large mark on her field of art history, and she has emerged as a major figure in Northern Renaissance, uh, Northern Renaissance art. An assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, she holds affiliate appointments in the departments of history and Germanic languages and literature. She is the author of Albrecht Dürer, and the Epistolary Mode of Address, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2016. Uh, in that book, she argues that the experience of writing, sending, and receiving letters shaped how Germany's most famous printmaker conceived of the message-bearing properties of the work of art. When Joseph Kerner of Harvard, who also happens to be an Academy trustee, reviewed uh, Durer and the Epistolary Mode, he wrote, Brisman's opening chapters are masterpieces of synthesis, weaving histories of letter writing and print culture with key aspects of Durer's practice. They allow us to see the artist's oeuvre from a new perspective, and all of Durer's prints look different after reading Brisman. The best monograph on the artist to have appeared in many years, it is also exemplary art history for its vivid writing, expositional clarity, and balance between historical context and close analysis of individual works. I'd like someone to write something like that about one of my books. Uh, since the publication of the Dora book, uh, Shira Brisman's articles have appeared in Art History, Zeitschrift for Kunst Kunstgeschichte, the Renaissance Quarterly, and many other leading jur journals. She has held curatorial positions at uh, the Jewish Museum in New York. In 2009, she was the Albrecht Durer Fellow at the Germanisches Nationalmuseum in Nuremberg, where she worked on the 2012 exhibition Der Frühe Durer, Durer. Her research has been supported by fellowships from the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the Albrecht Durer Scholarship at the Germanisches Nationalmuseum, the Samuel H. Kress Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, the American Philosophical Society, and the Kress Fellowship in the, in the Literature of Art at the Clark Art Institute. Shira Brisman's new project, The Goldsmith's Debt, is at least as ambitious as her first book, 
and deals with a crucial area of artistic creativity during the Renaissance. It focuses on the work of the Nuremberg goldsmith, Christoph Jamnitzer, and what he learned from his famous father, Wenzel Jamnitzer. The book closely examines uh, this one craft trade for evidence of the different conceptions of property that were in play during the 16th century. Scherer is interested in what the goldsmiths understood themselves to own, what they shared with the members of their trade, and how the pieces of metalwork and jewelry that they presented to their patrons established the ownership claims of those wealthy clients. Now, before I turn the floor over to our speaker, I just want to say uh, a few words about the our procedure this evening. After her presentation, which will last about 40 minutes, we will have a Q&A. Um, for those of you who are joining us by Zoom, you should see a Q&A uh, icon on your Zoom screen, and you can click there and begin submitting your questions as soon as you like. Um, we will do our very best to get as, to as many questions as we can. And so I want to thank you, Shira, for coming to be with us, Berlin, in what may, despite today's sunshine, be described as not the nicest time of the year, even without pandemic. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. That was so embarrassing. Um, thank you all for being here, and um, it's really, really a, an honor for me to be here to give the Richard von Weizsäcker Lecture. And I really want to thank the staff of the American Academy for taking care of every detail of my stay here and facilitating my behind-the-scenes entry into museums, archives, and libraries in Dresden, Prague, and Berlin. And I want to thank Barry Ebert and the infallible Johanna Gallup, and especially the president of the American Academy, Daniel Benjamin. Dan, thank you for supporting my research. Together, the staff here has created the perfect environment for visitors, fellows, and guests to think outside the framework of their own disciplines or professions, to encourage one another to develop and finish projects, and to engage in the open exchange of ideas. And this, the open exchange of ideas, is the subject of my talk this evening. Or more specifically, this talk is about the relationship of the open exchange of ideas to the allocation of the resources of the natural world. Are ideas like the air that we breathe or the waters of the ocean endlessly available and undiminishing in supply? Are they like fire that can catch and spread? Or are they like land, limited, partitionable, able to be cordoned off, bought, sold, or rented out for use by someone else? Is this distinction I've just made even logical? Is it true, as the just Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius argued in a 1609 treatise, The Freedom of the Seas, that the briny deep, boundless, and unconsumable belongs to no one? Should we take for granted that land, which is given to measurement and borders, and which may require cultivation to extend production, naturally offers itself up for management and ownership? Or is this notion culturally determined? My talk tonight is about the role that German goldsmiths working in the 16th and early 17th centuries in Nuremberg played in making visible and even tangible the analogies between the resources of the natural world and culturally determined concepts of property. My argument is that goldsmiths themselves had a very different concept of property than many of the clients for whom they made works of art. And because they understood this, the images and objects they fashioned could engage in a kind of doublespeak, articulating the interests of the owners and those of the makers. For example, the, in the cup I am showing you here by the Nuremberg goldsmith Elias Lenke, the presumed owner of this object shows off his access to silver and gold at the expense of his subject, the peasant, who harvests the landowner's grapes and presses them into wine, but who lacks enough clothing to cover himself beneath his jacket or repair the holes in his boots. Property is that which is proper to oneself. 
the concept is structured in an exclusive relationship to an individual or group. In German, the word for material property, Eigentum, with its prefix Eigen, captures this sense, as does the word Eigenschaft, which means property in a less material sense, as in one's own character, capacity, or talent. For the landowner, property, Eigentum, fit under the definition of the term given by the 14th century legal commentator Bartolus, who emphasized the positive aspects of ownership. Dominum, this was the Latin word for the concept of ownership, dominum is the right to dispose completely of any physical thing. Property was thus tan tangible, and the rights to it were reversible. A peasant could live on land, work the land, or even enjoy some of the fruits of his labor, but he could never consider the land his property because he did not possess the right to sell it. This was one definition of property that the goldsmith was often employed to represent. And it was by way of this understanding of the social hierarchy that many goldsmiths flattered their patron by placing the latter's subject, that is, those who were literally beneath him, in a position of subordination, at the stem of a vessel, for example, supporting a large and refillable bowl. In order to drink, the owner of the vessel, vessel might wrap his hand around his subordinate. Many of the works of the goldsmiths manifest what the patron could grasp and release, hold on to, or let go of. This is what I mean when I say that goldsmiths were in the profession of making visible and tangible one of the conceptions of property. Because the materials he worked with, gold and silver, had been disinterred from the earth, the goldsmith's craft naturally pointed to the association between wealth and land, sometimes explicitly so. For example, a design for a goblet that is signed by Conque Veltz shows at its base a mound where precious metal has been brought to the earth's surface from below. In the huts, miners are sorting and smelting. It is, if, it is as if the entire structure of the vessel were rising from this site where its material is being extracted and refined. Or so the drawing imagines that the goblet will perform this argument when it is actualized in gold and silver. Such an actualization can be seen in the example of a coconut cup that opens to reveal a hand stone, and the term in German is ein Hanstein, a mountainous cluster of ore, named because it is, the size, it is the size that can fit in a palm. And as I have mentioned, so many objects made for the display of the landed are designed to be clutched. So it's like he's got the whole world in his hands is the materialized mantra here. In this case, the stone is not from a single prill, but rather a mountain has been compiled from several minerals. Silver cast miners with pickaxes appear at the top, as well as at the foot of the goblet implying that the shaft being excavated is deep. Peeking out from amidst the landscape of laborers are two more figures, the naked Adam and Eve. Their presence within the mound of raw rock legitimates the ownership of the earth's precious yield by the descendants of the first parents in the book of Genesis. This was an entitlement that needed to be affirmed again and again in the aftermath of a discovery of a new world, a continent hitherto unknown to members of the European empire that was found to be both rich in ore and already inhabited. So one definition of property clung to by members of the nobility was a material entity that he had the legal right to dispose of. And this pertained both to land and to movable goods. The goldsmith could be called upon to make such movables, serving ware, dishes, plates used for, uh, for, for eating and display, point back to the land from which the materials had been sourced. The analogy that the movable object could behave like land was not only a visual metaphor, it could also be legally reinforced. In a cup made in 1565 for the Nuremberg patrician Veit Holzschuhe, this too by the goldsmith Elias Lenke, a knight presenting the family serves as the supportive structure of the vessel. He carries the family line. A row of enamels shows the coat of arms of Weitholzschuh's three wives. The underside of the lid reveals an embedded cast metal with a bust length portrait of Weitholzschuh. In his last will and testament, Holzschuh lists this cup 
expressing his wish that it stay in the family and be passed on from eldest son to eldest son and never melted down. This notion of property, according to the definition of Bartolos, as that which one could legally dispossess, was constitutive of the social identity of the noble landholder. The definition of property was that was constitutive to this craftsman's identity was what the historian Margaret Summers has called property in skill. Property in skill was something gained after a period of apprenticeship when, after having acquired technical know-how, the goldsmith in training would produce three prescribed works, a ring, the die of a seal, and a goblet to earn the position of master. Only once he had met this achievement could he be entitled to citizenship in the given city as well as the right to marry. The council took punitive measures when a craftsman still in training wed too early. In 1514, Hans Vischer was censured by the Nuremberg metalworkers because of his early nuptials. In 1593, in nearby Augsburg, a journeyman who had secured a spouse before presenting his masterpiece was forbidden to use precious materials. His punishment restricted his activities to modeling in wax or lead. He was not allowed to touch gold. These regulations controlled the quality of a city's craft and ensured a protocol for succession. If a master died and his son was too young to pass his master's exam, or if the deceased did not have a male heir, his wife could inherit the shop for up to three years, after, she was, after which she was to marry a journeyman or assistant who could qualify as master. Given that the landed nobility's property was defined largely as something physical, exclusive, a land or good that he had the right to alienate, and the, craftsman proper, and the craftsman's property was defined by social relationships, and it granted him, among other things, the right to train others, then it may not be surprising to see that different natural metaphors would be suitable to each group, or that they would use natural metaphors in different ways. In the rest of my talk, I will demonstrate these differences, and I will do so by introducing a new form of artistic product that began to emerge on the market starting in 1538. This was the printed booklet of design proposals. It's definitely going to be on the exam. Let me explain what this genre of printed book was and the special role that Goldsmiths played in its production. Goldsmiths had a unique relationship to etching and engraving. They used the process of incising images into metal to decorate the surface of their forms. I'm showing you here the so-called dragon ewer by the Nuremberg goldsmith Christoph Jamnitzer. In a heart-shaped frame on the side of the vessel, Jamnitzer has etched the figure of the Greek god Dionysus, in Roman mythology known as Bacchus, the god of winemaking, fertility, and ecstasy. Yeah, you can see him a little better. Goldsmiths could easily apply the practice they had in incising images into metal to flat surfaces of copper, which could be inked, then pressed onto pieces of paper to produce a print. This technology was used by goldsmiths as early as the 1460s to circulate designs for ornamentation of objects or designs for objects themselves, as we see here in the example of Martin Schongauer. Who was, raised in a Nuremberg golds I'm sorry, who was raised in a goldsmith shop and who became one of the great printmakers of the 15th century. So I'm showing you on the left Schongauer's design for a sprig of vegetation. The engraving in the middle shows his design for a container used for burning incense in religious ceremonies, and on the right is a detail of that object. Goldsmiths used the medium of print to circulate designs to members of their own workshop and beyond. Such images share delightful motifs, and it is up to the user of the print to decide how to apply them. These prints offer themselves up as samples. They reach to the natural metaphor of a botanical specimen to refer self-consciously to what they are doing. These are images that have been selected, are given to others for the take, with the expectation that in their hands something new will grow. On the right, I'm showing you a print by Bartel Bayham, where a figure with his back turn reaches into a pot from which a plant is growing. It's bending stem that casts a shadow on the background. What we are observing is the cultivation of a decorative pattern, the rearing, if you will, of a design. 
Beginning, as I have said, in, in 1538, goldsmiths began to gather their designs into booklets and add title pages. With the rubric of text, they presented these compilations to fellow members of their trade, to craftsmen in other media, and even to audiences outside the workshop tradition. The cultivation of craft pra practitioners, as well as more general buyers, could happen directly. On one title page for designs of serving vessels, artists began to advertise their collections as useful for goldsmiths, as well as for anyone who loves art. The etchings and engravings could thus function as prototypes for other artisans, as a shopping catalog for desires for the for potential commissioner of metalwork objects, or they could just serve autonomously as images for the collector of prints. And it is this point about multiple forms of address that I wish to stress as I return to the topic of property in its material and immaterial forms. This genre that I've just introduced you to, the booklet of design proposals, has, I wish to argue, something to say about the topic of ownership at large. But what it has to say is not a single message. Rather, what this form of compilation offers is the coexistence of different models of property in a single volume that addresses both other artisans and the class of collectors and patrons. So for the remainder of my talk, I wish to illustrate this point about the coexistence of different models of property by focusing on a single example of the genre, a booklet of design proposals by the Nuremberg goldsmith Christoph Jamnitzer. So you've met him already. He's the producer of the dragon ewer that I showed you earlier. And I'm showing you here a portrait of him on the left and introducing him to you as the main character in my study of the relationship of goldsmiths to the topic of property. Christoph Jamnitzer was born in Nuremberg in 1563 and died there in 1618. Over the course of his career, he produced metalwork objects for emperors, noblemen, city council members, and merchants. In 1610, he published a book of designs called The New Book of Grotesques. While his etchings have been enjoyed by art historians for their fantastical spirit, the satirical tone of its images and texts have masked the sophistication of its so social messages. It is the book's multiple political and ethical positions on property that I hope to expose to you tonight. So Janitzer's new book of grotesques contains 60 pages of etched designs. Some of these show clipped specimens against a blank page in the tradition of Martin Schongauer's from the 1470s that I showed you earlier. Others follow in the tradition of Jacob Bink and Bartel Bayam, where a puto or other creature presents the motif. So here, for example, in an allegory representing Earth as one of the five elements, a, put, a puto with its back turned in the matter of Bink is balancing a large basket of the harvest. A few offerings have fallen to the ground. The new book of grotesques opens with a declaration to a potential client, a nobleman named Karl Ludwig Fernberger zu Egenberg. The goldsmith is trying to solicit a commission for a metalwork object, and he hopes that Egenberg will find in the etchings an idea for a piece of craft that he would like to have. In this open letter, Christoph Jamnitzer asserts that he does not wish to compare himself to Christopher Columbus, nor align his invention with that of the explorer. In stating so, he reveals his intention to do just that. The focal point of the dedication to Fernberger is a story about setting precedent. Jamnitzer tells of how Columbus was treated with scorn at an official state dinner after having returned to Europe. Provoked by his Spanish companions, who boast that had the Genoese not made the discovery, a Spaniard navigator would have done so instead, Columbus challenges his hosts to a competition to see who can make an egg stand up on its own. When his deriders fail, Columbus accomplishes the feat himself by mashing the tip of the egg, giving it a surface on which to balance. The silent response to his demonstration conveys that his disparagers have understood his point. So Yamnitzer writes, because he was the first to invent, 
he broke new ground for a discernible and easy path for all those who came after him. They should have tried to invent a passage to India rather than mock and cut down the one who had undertaken such a thing in the first place. The goldsmith sets as the basis for his likeness to the explorer on their shared fate of being treated with contempt for setting an exemplar that all could follow. Yelnitzer's account of, the, of Columbus's egg closely paraphrases the story told in Geralmo Benzoni's History of the New World, which was published in an illustrated edition by Theodore de Brie in Frankfurt in 1594 as part of his multi-volume Great Voyages, a collection of accounts of European travels to the West Indies. The print representing the dinner party appears in America Book 4, Distinguished and Admirable History of Western India, discovered for the first time by Christopher Columbus in the year 1492. The debris engraving, which I have been showing you here, depicts the explorer seated at the center of a table, gesturing to the egg that he has made stand upright. Christoph Jamnitzer, in his new book of grotesques, does not, in fact, illustrate the story of Columbus's egg in the same narrative manner that Debris does, though he does quote loosely from Debris' translation, making it clear to me that he would have known Debris' widely known text. Yamnitzer pictorializes the story he narrates in the dedication by reducing it to its essence, the balanced egg, framed by the phrase, Ea ver acht als gemacht, it is easier to mock than to make. Yanutzer's actual application of the term invention in his dedication refers to Columbus's proposal and his quest to invent a middle passage to India. In other words, Columbus's invention, in Yamnitzer's telling, is his bid to contrive something that others might follow. The goldsmith draws the comparison to Columbus with his booklet of images for things that could potentially be possessed. The dedication articulates the power of the patron to call a gilded silver object into being from an etched design. The broadly shared images have the possibility to become bespoke wares of exclusive ownership by an individual. Yamnitzer's booklet furnishes Fanberger with a vision of what he might own if he issues the decree. It offers him the opportunity to turn ideas into gold. Columbus, too, had extended to his patrons the opportunity to turn ideas into gold. The terms of acquisition were already written before his ships set sail. In the capitulations of Santa Fe of April 30th, 1492, the charter that established the ideological and economic terms of the enterprise, Ferdinand and Isabella had commissioned the admirable, admiral to, quote, he was not admirable, the admiral to, quote, discover, take possession, govern, and trade in whatever islands and mainlands he might come across on his westward, on his westward journey. In return for having discovered and conquered the territories in this manner, Columbus was guaranteed criminal and civil authority over them as viceroy and governor, one-tenth of all merchandise acquired, one-third of the royal fifth to be gained from any future expeditions not under his own command. This was all agreed upon before the ship set sail. Whatever he was to find had been determined preemptively to become a part his and the rest the property of the Spanish crown. Columbia, the, the Colombian capitulations and the Elizabethan charters that would follow in their precedent were proprietary designs in the legal sense. The privileges conferred governance upon an imperial representative and granted the right of occupation and use of properties to the royal estate bestowing the charter. The language of the documents prefigured the very discoveries that they would claim to have made. Linguistically, they produced the world to be appropriated, and this is accentuated in the use of the imperative tense by which the admiral is, quote, to discover, take possession, govern, and trade. What I'm suggesting here is that navigational charters and printed design proposals share features as anticipatory claims of possession, an overlap that has heretofore been dangerously downplayed by attention to the playful tendencies of the print. 
What Columbus delivered to his patrons upon the return from the first voyage of 1492 was not only the captives he had seized and the samples of the gold he had taken. He also furnished the Spanish monarchs and the European imagination at large with the image of a land abundant in supply of precious materials and the labor to extract it. In a widely published letter to Luis de Saint-Angel, dated February 15th, 1493, and I'm showing you one of the Latin editions from uh, 1494 on the left and the German translation published in 1497 on the right, Columbus recounts in two swift sentences his arrival and seizure of the land. So this is like the most compact event, right? He says, in 33 days, I passed from the Canary Islands to the Indies with the fleet, which the most illustrious king and queen, our sovereigns, gave to me. And there I found very many islands filled with innumerable people. And of them all, I have taken possession for their highnesses by the proclamation I have made and by unfurling the royal flag. And I was not contradicted. Punct. <laughs> So this is, in fact, an open letter, a redacted version of the news Columbus, Columbus had sent to members of the Spanish court. It contains a version of the description of the Indies tailored to what the crown wished readers to know. The announcement that he was not contradicted by members of the Arawak tribe, who, by the way, were hearing his language for the first time and who had no concept of land as alienable real estate, was essential to the claim that he had taken possession of the lands. This goes back to an idea in Roman law. In the Digest of Justinian, Ulpian writes of the illegitimacy of property that has been seized by stealth. Quote, without the knowledge of him who he suspects would oppose his taking. Thus, it was important that the letter declare the absence of contradiction. This is one of the three key legal claims that Columbus's letter provides for Ferdinand and Isabella that, by certain European definitions of the legitimacy of property transfer, justified the acquisition of Hispaniola and its surrounding islands. Columbus continues, I have taken possession of all the lands for their highnesses, and all are more richly endowed than I have skill and power to say and I hold them all in the name of their highnesses, who can dispose thereof as much and as completely as of the kingdoms of Castile. So Columbus is referring to the definition of property attributed to Bartolus that I have cited earlier, the definition as that which one has the right to alienate. When he claims that Ferdinand and Isabella can dispose of the islands, he is affirming their ownership of the instantly acquired lands. There's another rhetorical tactic that has legal consequences present in Columbus's so-called letter of discovery, and that is his description of the limitlessness of the riches of the land and the infinitude of its dwellers. He writes, in the earth there are many mines of metals, in the island there is incalculable gold, and there are very many islands, very many island people with inhabitants beyond number. This notion of limitlessness joined with other claims to furnish legal evidence to the Spanish right to appropriate what Columbus had found. That was the admiral's description of the so-called Indians' lack of an established concept of private property. Columbus writes of the peoples he finds. They are artless and generous with what they have to such a degree as no one would believe it but he who had seen it. Of anything they have, if it be asked for, they never say no, but do rather invite the person to accept it and show as much lovingness as though they would give their own hearts. And whether it be a thing of value or one of little worth, they are straightway content with whatsoever trifle or whatsoever kind may be given them in return. He goes on to say, they strive to combine in giving us things which they have in abundance and of which we are in need. And finally, nor have I been able to learn whether they have personal property, for they live in commonality and share especially edible things, and they have a great love for one another. If it sounds as though Columbus is describing a utopia of the docile, what he is actually doing is establishing the legal condition for dispossession. Having sailed west and south below the equator, he also conceived of himself as having traveled back in time, to a pre-civilized state. 
to which legal system was Columbus here appealing? Here he was appealing to what the Romans had deemed to be natural law, which was also known as universal law. For a definition of natural law, I'll turn to the 16th century Wittenberg jurist, Melchior Kling, who was paraphrasing his Roman sources when he wrote, Natural law consists of general rules which are inscribed in the human mind by nature and which set out the best and most perfect way of life. The important point here is that by this so-called natural law, civilization was defined as having begun with, you guessed it, the establishment of private property. Civilization was marked by the natural reason that whatever previously had not been owned by someone else becomes the property of the first taker. And this is uh, is a claim that goes back to uh, Justinian's Institutes. So thus, in making the claim that the inhabitants of the lands he had discovered had no discernible concept of private property, Columbus was legally situating the Spanish crown to seize the islands, their subterranean treasures, and their inhabitants as their own. Columbus's report on his invention of the the islands he believed were part of the West Indies earned him three augmentations to his family's coat of arms. These were bestowed by Ferdinand and Isabella on May 20th, 1493, after the return from his first voyage. For the first and second quarters of his shield, he was granted a castle and a lion. For the third quarter, he was granted, quote, gilded islands in sea waves. In effect, Columbus was granted an image of golden islands for providing the Spanish monarchy with an image of golden islands. His published letter was crafted to convey the infinitude of precious metal and the unending supply of labor to extract it. The key point I wish to make here is about how the idea of abundance, the notion of nature as providing an unlimited supply, is used in the Columbus letter to establish a sense of a pre-civilized, pre-lapsarian state that is ripe to be and ready to be seized. Lands, peoples, and ore are ready to be captured if they have not previously been claimed. All the Spanish had to do was arrive first, stake a flag, and announce the discovery to the readership on the other side of the sea. The idea of nature's infinitude was, and is, needless to say, a fiction. The fantasy would not survive half a century. By 1525, disease and the toxic conditions in alluvial mines would obliterate the indigenous populations of Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Epidemics in 1520 and 1545 would reduce the indigenous population of central Mexico by one-third. By 1545, the American gold deposits would be nearly depleted, and colonists, including German investors, would redeploy their extractive technologies to the mining of silver and redirect their exploitative practices of enslavement to West African captives. Now, I've done a deep dive into the rhetoric and law surrounding the so-called discovery of the West Indies, or the invention, of you will, if you will, of the New World, for the purpose of trying to persuade you that when Christoph Jamnitzer evokes the Genoese explorer in his dedication to Carl Ludwig von Fernberger zu Egenberg, he is doing more than describing artistic rivalry by claiming the first to be the first to have paved the way for images that other craftsmen may follow. There is much more here than the matter of authorship at stake. What I hope to have exposed you to is the ideological framework behind a book that promises a future realization of a tangible object. The book is addressed to a potential patron, a nobleman, whose standing in society was determined, no matter what else he had done, written or said in his life, by his claim to land that he had inherited from generations of familial ownership. Now, to be clear, I'm not making the claim that Fernberger had any stake in the new world. I have no evidence that he had ever been to the Americas or that he had made financial investments there. Although I should note as a side note that um, in trying to figure out who this patron was, um, I did discover that his nephew, who's also named Christoph, um, 20 years after this this book was printed, would become uh, the first unwilling Nav- a German navigator, circumnavigator of the world. So, um, uh, so Christoph uh, Fanberger zu Egenberg uh, was actually uh, um, 
a mercenary who was captured by the Dutch uh, and, and ended up circumnavigating the world, but not of his own uh, intention, but as a kind of uh, prisoner. But that, that, that happens after this book is published. Um, but I, I, I sort of like to imagine that that history is kind of like lurking in this, uh, in this book. So um, I also don't have evidence that Christoph Jomnetzer's bid for a commission was a success. I've not been able to trace any of the existing works by this artist to ownership by Carl Ludwig von Fenberger. It is possible that, in this regard, the new book of grotesques did not achieve its ambition, or at least this aspect of what it aimed to do. What the book does achieve is that it demonstrates how inventors, including artists, poets, scientists, and navigators, makers, if you will, of designs, could furnish what the then ruling class with ideas for how to use materials to assert their stable position in society. The gilded silver objects produced by Yamnitzer and his contemporaries often relied on the format of the vessel to represent a social order and to sustain the fiction that the land from which the materials are derived will continue to supply a stable p position and wealth. This is the significance of the refillable cup whose contents are resupplied once drained. These were objects that were made for use at the table, but also for display, an abundance of reassurances about abundance that many museums today sustain. So, property is something to, uh, proper to the self, which he, and only he, has the right to give away. It is individually owned, passed down from generations, and its value is asserted by pointing back to the model of property par excellence, the, ma the model of land. This is one of the ideas presented in Yamnitzer's new book of grotesques in the dedication to his potential patron, Carl Ludwig van Berger zu Egenberg. But it is just one. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, this culturally determined notion of property that flatters the social standing of the client is presented alongside other notions. But property, as I have indicated, for the craftsman himself meant something else. Jamnitzer demonstrates this when, in the page immediately following his dedication to Fernberger, he writes another address. This time he claims that his new book of grotesques is for all those who are, quote, artistically inclined, young people who want to learn something, and those who are devoted to etching or otherwise wish to delight and amuse themselves thereby. What follows is a rhymed poem in which he announces that he is putting forward his images for young students. He is not trying to solicit the praise of the high-minded speakers of Latin. And he, and he writes, For this reason I am quite contented, and my etching tool is even-handed. Because this booklet for no great artist be, who already knows much more than me, but rather for the novice in his salad days to push his needle in vi virtuous ways namely to handle it with delicacy and know how to control its mobility. He'll employ it finally towards usefulness and perhaps will follow his thankfulness. Nested then within the bid to his patron for the chance to earn reward for fashioning an object in silver and gold is a gesture to his fellow craftsmen where he presents his design ideas as available for anyone to take. In the case of this, one, uh, of this one of the book's ambitions, I do have evidence of Janitzer's success. Whereas finding a gilded silver vessel traceable to Christoph's hand that was owned by Fernberger has thus not far yielded success, it has been easier to trace the influences of his images on other printmakers, as well as other fashion, fashioners of gilded silver wares. So here, for example, I'm showing you two prints that I had the pleasure to see in the Kupferstich Kabinett uh, in Berlin last week um, it, here in the State Museum. So the collection ha houses um, an album of tiny engravings that were submitted by Nuremberg goldsmiths along with their masterpieces when they applied to become master. And this was not a requirement written into the ordinances of the trade. It seems rather... This submission of the uh, engraving seems to have been a custom that we can trace 
to the year 1628. That's the earliest uh, dated engraving in this collection. When applicants began to submit these prints as a sort of calling card, along with the prescribed works, the cup, the uh, die, and the seal, uh, the ring and the, and the seal die, in order to be uh, promoted to their craft. So these two examples that I'm showing you here, one dated 1646, shows us that the applicants had no qualms about introducing themselves by hearkening back to a Nuremberg goldsmith from an earlier time. Both of these prints are clearly based on models from the new book of grotesques by Christoph Jamnitzer, who had died in 1618. The influence of the new book of grotesques upon other artists has had a long life. So here I'm showing you a, um, a silver platter fashioned by the Augsburg goldsmith Paul Solanier in the first decade of the 18th century, which draws its inspiration from Christoph Jamnitzer's Allegory of Earth. Though defying the printmaker's proclivity for backsides, he turns the figure around. The point I wish to make in drawing your attention to Jamnitzer's poem, to the gesture of making public his sharing of artistic ideas, and to his success in doing so, is that this action and its effects represents a different conception of property. Here, property is also, one could say, what one is able to give away. But the difference is this. For the landholder, for the proprietor, Property is that which one has the right to give away, and in doing so, one no longer has it. That is, property is that which is limited in supply. It is an expendable resource. The goldsmith's concept of property is that which he can share with others and which does not, upon doing so, diminish in supply. This attitude is illustrated well in one of the most famous texts about property in the European tradition. In his treatise on duties, Cicero, who's in fact quoting here the Roman poet Ennius, writes, who kindly sets a wanderer on his way, does so even, at, does even as if he lit another's lamp by his. No less shines his when he his friends hath lit. In this example, he effectively teaches us all to bestow even upon a stranger what it costs us nothing to give. So Cicero claims that this is what binds humanity together, that we give to one another what it costs us nothing to give. And the Roman statesman has a short list of three entities, there are only three, which fall in, into this category. And they are, for Cicero, water, fire, and advice. These statements defy ownership because, they're physical, because of their physical nature. Unpartitionable and non-depletable, their supply does not wane when shared. Jamnitzer makes public with his rhymed couplet address to fellow craftsmen that artistic designs are an inexpendable resource of this ilk. So too do his images defend this point. In the sequence of 60 pages, many of which have multiple images, the creatures have an animate quality. As they float, they smoke, they blow wind at each other and defecate. They self-ignite. These activities point to their infinitude, to the unending capacity of their production. The artist is capable of continuing to produce abundant images in endless supply, and for this reason he can give them to others at no loss to himself. When Johann von Schwarzenberg pr prepared a German translation of Cicero's treatise for publication in 1531, he presented on duties as moral education for the sake of the common good. The printed marginalia next to the Aeneas passage indicates that it describes what one should share with another as common. The pertaining woodcut shows one figure pointing the way to a traveler, while another, with his candle, tips his wick to lend kin kindling to a fellow man. Schwarzenberg's take on Cicero was a generous one. Himself a man of property, Cicero's ethics are driven by the need to avoid injury to the bestower. In short, he wants the wealthy to keep on owning what they own and for no one to take it away. 
His list of items permissible to share with strangers is so short, remember those three, right, water, fire, and advice, that his notion of how to contribute to the common good may seem laughably stingy. As the basis for policies about extending foreign aid, the test of Ennius, that we tender to those at a distance only what it costs us nothing to give, is painfully cruel. But as the basis for a law about knowledge, ideas, and counsel, the passage is startling in its expression of the non-proprietary status of these intangibles. What we would call intellectual property by its extendability without diminishment, not property at all, is not circumscribable to the self. It is, as the legal scholar Jeremy Sheff has argued, by natural law, something we are morally obligated to share. Christoph Janitzer's new book of grotesques, published in Nuremberg in 1610, manifests the coexistence of different concepts of property. These are expressed in the artist's written addresses to his potential patron and to the fellow members of his trade. In order to share these with you, I have reached for the same metaphors that artists, philosophers, and lawmakers have long looked to, to explain moral, philosoph moral philosophical positions of who ought to have the right to what, how such ownership ought to be attained, and, what obligation, and with what obligations it comes. These are the metaphors of natural resources. Land in European legal thought and in the legal tradition established in the, in the Americas since Columbus's raising of the Spanish flag is partitionable, suitable to boundaries, and scarce. Water, fire, and air in Cicero's thinking and in Cicero's thinking advice can never de be diminished and therefore ought to be shared. In calling attention to the analogies that lurk behind Yamnitzer's multiple addresses, and I would argue his images, I hope to push back on two centuries of scholarship that have classified Yamnitzer's prints and, the, and the, the, the category to which they belong as playful examples of artistic freedom that, quote, lack any purpose. The new book of grotesques is not only a pattern book for decorations, but also for complex social messages that can take up residence side by side. Thanks everyone for your attention. So I'm happy to take questions from the audience and um, for those of you who are zooming in, um, Dan is going to um, faithfully read your questions to me without editing them. That was really wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about um, how you came to this uh, idea, if it's something that you have been, if it's continuous with other research that you've done, or just how you came to be interested in the new book of grotesques. Um, I, I mean, there is a continuity with the first book on Dürer and letter writing. I think in in um, that experience made me think where I was thinking a lot about the relationship of privacy to publicity and how messages can be um, both personal and public and how one can be embedded in the other. Um, and, and in that project, I was looking at this phenomenon in the era of print and, and uh, in the context of the Protestant Reformation. Um, and I, I think that um, that that sensitized me to um, thinking about the coexistence of multiple messages in in a single work of art, and how um, the artist might might be um, having things to say to different uh, to different audiences. And I think it's so interesting how Yamnitzer, in his addresses, um, uh, does this quite explicitly with his textual language. Um, in terms of the new book of grotesques. Um, this project, honestly, is a very long 
apology for my first reaction when I first saw it. <laughs> um, and that was to an artist who showed it to me uh, and, and said, you really should write about this. Um, these are, you know, who said, in fact, these, you know, shaped my thinking. They're so inspirational. Um, you should write a book about them. And at the moment, my knee-jerk response is, well, these are very, you know, fun and lovely for, for somebody who's creative, for an artist, for a maker. But I thought they had no historical positioning. I, I was completely blind to that at the time. Um, that was something I said, I think, 16 years ago. I ended up marrying the guy who showed me the book. So this is like a very long apology letter, this project, uh, for that, for that knee-jerk response, um, which I, which I came to, uh, realize was, um, uh, that at the time I didn't have the apparatus to historically situate what I was seeing. And yet the more I worked with these, I sort of couldn't get them out of my mind. And the more I worked with them, the more I felt that um, there was really a, a context lurking there that was not, that, that what I was looking at was not simply trans-historical, that actually there was a specific moment when these were produced and began uh, to circulate on the market, um, and, and that it had more to do uh, with with just the artists trying to solicit commissions at a time when they were no longer um, receiving as many uh, commissions for the church, right? That was something that Goldsmiths faced at this time. Um, but that there was actually a, a deeply embedded um, uh, coding of language uh, uh, about a, a social structure. Thank you. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Hi Philip. Um, Really lovely, lovely talk, lovely material. I have a very specific question, and I don't know if it's... Um, and this isn't even probably a scholarly question. It's more coming out of my Vorverständnis from German. Um, and it has to do with the semantics of the term Erfinder that figured in your talk. So Columbus is designated as the Erfinder of the quote-unquote new world, um, which you wouldn't call him anymore in contemporary German, obviously, because an Afinda is an inventor. Mm -hmm. you would, he would be an Endeka. Mm -hmm. And um, as I understand it, there in the material you're presenting, there is a slide going on between discovering, claiming, and making, as in generating, and mm -hmm. probably also to... There might be a theological kind of third term, as in creation... Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on that and help me understand how these maybe are not differentiated at the time. Yes, you're 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 exactly right, Philip. And I think maybe your your question is coming from one of the slides I showed from um, the debris book uh, has the title in German where it says that um, Columbus is the the first erfinder, the first inventor of of the new world. Um, so let me let me answer your question about terminology in a moment, but let me say something very um, specific, a very historical, specific historical point that I want to make, which is that Columbus himself did not think that he had discovered a new world. He believed that he had discovered the Indies, which had been foretold, that he had read about this place, and that's what he had found. Um, it was, in fact, Vespucci, Amerigo Vespucci, who was the first one to say, this is a new world. And uh, it is, and it was actually the German printmaker Martin Waldseemuller uh, in 1507 produced the first map with the word America. Uh, there is, it's a massive multi-block print, and there's only one uh, uh, extant copy of it, and it's in uh, the Library of Congress in Washington D.C. So, just so you all know that <laughs> that the name for uh, uh, the country of America, and also that therefore for this academy, uh, comes from uh, a, an attribution made by um, the German Martin Waldseemuller. Um, anyway, to answer your question about terminology, you are right that there is a slip. Um, there is a, the concept of inventor, the difference between invention and discovery, which modern German um, makes a, this distinction be, between Erfindung and Entdeckung. Um, in the early modern period, to invent meant both, uh, really meant to uh, discover and to make something new. And that was precisely for what you intuited, Philip, for this theological reason um, that, that 
it would have been heretical to claim that anyone had, but except God, had invented ex nihilo. Um, so all creators were discoverers in the sense that uh, every all creators were um, uncovering something that had been hidden um, by God after the fall. Uh, and for that reason, we we have this. Um, we have this slippage, uh, and so I think even uh, Christoph Jomnitzer himself, even with his wild imagination, uh, would have considered himself uh, a discoverer in that sense. Yes, sure. not. Hi. Um, I had a very similar question, actually, so I'm glad to be able to follow up on this. So I was also struck by moving between inventor and uh, discoverer in the context of Columbus. And I, and I want to ask you kind of conceptually how should we should think about the kind of property rights of the inventor as opposed to the discoverer. So, so in the case of Columbus, it seems like what he, dis what do we, we would say discovered was something very valuable, namely, you know, the path to the Americas. And had he just come up with a very intricate naval path that was really beautiful, but otherwise not useful to that end, it's not clear he would have been, you know, given all those uh, kind of rewards. So, so thinking about what he, what he came up with, which is something valuable, I'm just wondering in, the, in those cases, as you just said, uh, Hamnitsa took himself to be discovering something, I guess whence is the confidence? Uh, what, kind of in what sense is the sense that there's a discovery here such that it's also worth kind of replicating and passing on to those novices who might learn something from it? Um, it seems like there's a big conceptual gap here to think that there's something here that's kind of already worth calling ownership over uh, mm -hmm. in this case. I'm so just curious how to kind of uh -huh. how to think about that. So why why the bombastic uh, I mean this the book is so brilliantly um, because it's sort of satirically modest, right? Um, he says, I'm not trying to address any of these highfalutin Latin speakers, you know, I'm just I'm just uh, you know trying to help out the young guys who don't have a lot of imagination. Um, <laughs> but he but he calls this the new book of grotesques. And in fact, uh, the generations of art historians before me have done a lot of work to trace the sources, and, and a lot of my work has been to trace uh, some of his pictorial sources, where in fact, um, this, uh, this image that I'm showing you is not, in fact, his own invention. It's something uh, borrowed from a, um, a fable, uh, a illustrated German fable, um, that he then sort of augments. Um, so what is the, the confidence associated with doing something new? Well, I think that's a great question, and I, I, I really think that it comes out of print culture. I really think that it comes out of this sudden idea that you have something called news, that you have something uh, where um, uh, images and information uh, scientific uh, updates to earlier ideas are reaching a broad public and they need to advertise themselves as, uh, as, as something that is distinctive from uh, a, a, a past or something that is distinctive from something else. And what is interesting about this term new, so you have, you know, the use of this, like, the, the word new appears everywhere. New this, new that. Every, every print wants to claim that it's new. But this designation was, in fact, uh, had a legal apparatus attached to it, which is that if one wanted a privilege, if one wanted to um, apply for a privilege, uh, uh, what we would call a copyright to have a restricted period where um, uh, other artists would would be fined or um, punished if they copied your work. The the administrating bodies, whether you were going to the Nuremberg uh, Council or the uh, imperial uh, uh, body for this privilege, would determine whether or not what you had done was new. Um, in fact, the criteria was that it had to be new and it had to be useful, and it had to be able to be reproduced. So those were the three things. And this criteria of newness then um, becomes something that, in fact, is able to protect um, artists' uh, artists' work. Uh, the, and I've seen examples of, I've been very uh, fascinated to see the rejected submissions, right? So the um, actually there are print books where uh, the council explicitly says, there is nothing new here, sorry. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's a wonderful question because I think that confidence comes out of a very new idea about what was new.
Amy? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. This was wonderful. So as a cartoonist, I'm interested in the humor in the, the book of the new book of grotesques and if you use this phrase the playfulness of print and I'm wondering if you've seen a correlation between humor playfulness and images that can be printed and reproduced um, yeah and if so why do you think that that yeah. correlation exists I think there's a correlation between Yes, I think that's such a smart question, Amy. And there is a correlation between um, uh, humor and the copy, right? And I think we see this visually really happening with these 16th century printmakers. For example, one of the motifs that I, I sort of indicated uh, in the talk tonight by showing you a lot of backsides, right? You see a lot of rumps. And the idea is that anyone who's ever made a print knows that when somebody, when you make a print, right, you draw, um, you have your, you have your uh, design on the plate, but when you press that to a piece of paper, whatever you've made uh, will, will result in a reversed image. So the very idea of reversal, that, that topos of reversal is embedded in the medium. And the artists love to deal with this. Like, they're, they're so smart in the way that they use reversal, right? They use reversal to indicate to somebody else, oh, you're going to have to flip this around, right? If, you're gonna, if you want it to look like this, you're going to have to do it the other way. And they're kind of cueing that, I think, um, in the prints themselves. The other thing that's quite interesting, I mean, I was, I was mentioning earlier, you know, the, the relationship of the print to the Reformation. And one of the things you see is the reappropriation of images um, to argue two sides of the case or two sides of the uh, political spectrum. And this becomes a motif of kind of, you know, the beast uh, who makes fun of the Pope becomes the beast who makes fun of Luther. And you could just actually, you know, add a different head in there or put a different hat uh, on the image. And it's, an, it's a reappropriation for completely different means. So I think absolutely there's um, the, the, the transmittability of ideas through this medium in fact, licenses that kind of um, humor and a humor that's bent on uh, reversal, on, on adaptation. So we have uh, several questions from the home audience. Um, uh, one that um, seems uh, especially interesting is uh, wonderful, Cheryl. I'm, I am curious about recompense. What is transacted in the idea that labor or skill can be bought or paid for? It seems in your picture that those to whom Yamnitzer throws open his printed inventions owe him nothing in exchange, as it were, but at the same time they can they take up the models. They may enter a condition of debt from which they cannot emerge. This gets into the complexities of the gift economy. Is this a useful thought? Mm. Um. It, is this a useful thought? So what is owed to somebody? Uh, you know, we, we talk about debt and saying, you know, I like every acknowledgement says I am indebted to, right? Uh, uh, when you publish a book, you, you list uh, the, the people and institutions uh, to whom uh, you are indebted. So is this, uh, is this idea of use, uh, a useful thought? What do you get back? Well, I would say, uh, let me answer this very... Um, not so much philosophically, but very concretely, uh, what, what, what you get when you look at the ordinances of Nuremberg Goldsmiths is you get an assurance that if you participate in this, um, in this particular craft, and in Nuremberg, I should say, um, there are no guilds in Nuremberg after, after the 14th century, so they're not guilds per se, but the, the craft of, of uh, Goldsmiths is very highly regulated, as, as you know from what I told you about all the rules about um, marriage and, and b becoming master and such. And so what you get is an assurance that nobody is going to uh, do something beyond uh, this 
tight system that that is held in place by these regulations. So for example, right, it would be like if we said to our graduate students, you cannot publish, no matter what you've discovered, you cannot publish before you get your PhD, right? That's just, you have to attain this certain level before you can do something. Um, and what I've been very interested in is tracking uh, what, what, um, uh, what what happens when people break the ordinances. So, for example, there's an example in Nuremberg of um, journeymen who start to make their own molds, right, their own models, um, and sell them to patrons directly rather than working through the workshop system. And this is strictly censured, right? It sort of, um, it, it, it cuts out, it works outside this uh, system that the council and that the craftsmen want to keep in place. So I think what the artist gets back, now I think many of my colleagues would probably say what the artist gets back from giving is fame, right? Their, their name is known, uh, um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm really trying to work against this idea um, of authorship and not to say that it's not there, but to say there's something else here. And what that other thing is, is this social structure that is um, very tightly controlled and kept in place. I'm going to add my own coda to that question, which is, uh, what do we know about, um, you know, the kind of radical religious ideas that start circulating in this period among craftsmen in this particular milieu? Radical ideas? Well, you know, it's the beginning of the Reformation. Everyone's... Uh -huh. uh, got their own ideas about, you know, free property, uh, politi uh, against political authority, all kinds of different things are going on. Is there a linkage there? <laughs> well, um, you had to be careful because you could, you, could, you could be sent uh, out of the city, right? This happens to three famously uh, godless painters um, uh, in Nuremberg right after the Reformation who are made to leave the city uh, because they're, they're – uh, associated with the Anabaptist movement. Um, and these three painters, two of them are Bahams and the other is Pence, uh, we actually have the transcription of the trial, which is fascinating. And they're asked all these things like, you know, do you, do you believe that about the presence of God in the host? You know, what do you believe about baptism? And one of the questions, which is very interesting for me, is um, do you believe that people should have private property? because you could get kicked out of the city if you said no, right? The, the, the council was very, it was very important to them to maintain the idea of private property. It was a, it was a considerable threat, this idea of, um, you know, of, of, of a reallocation uh, of, of personal goods. And so what could happen to you was you could get, you know, sent to the city, lose your livelihood, you lose your connections, uh, you could you could lose your hands. I mean, there was also corporal punishment, depending on how uh, badly um, uh, you had you had transgressed in this way. Um, the I, I think what is really uh, fascinating is how, therefore, how hard it is to tell when we're hearing the artist's real voice. Right? When are they bearing their own messages in something that could also appeal uh, to to um, uh, to, to a censure or to, to a patron or to somebody uh, from whom the artist might, might very uh, greatly diverge. So one more uh, from uh, the Zoom audience. Uh, I'm wondering if you think that the format of the grotesques themselves, these monstrous recombination of parts that breach natural categories and that may not incidentally go against natural law, has some connection to the lingering imaginary of the new world, the idea of monstrous races, monstrous productions in the vast infinitude of the world beyond Europe, an idea that persisted sometimes despite and sometimes through the very compromised documentary words and images coming back from eyewitnesses. That's, um, I think, certainly true, and I think there's been really uh, strong scholarship to support this idea um, uh, of uh, you know, of and, and to track these claims about the monstrous peoples and their um, uh, and their and their habits. For example, cam cannibalism, right, is a big theme uh, that that comes back. Uh, these reports of of people who are savages who are eating other people. 
Um, and the reports being both um, textual, uh, using this term eyewitness, uh, but also visual, right? Also, especially this, this is happening in prints. Um, and I think that that's Im certainly important scholarship, and I certainly think it is quite possible, therefore, to read that dark history into these seemingly playful prints, right? If, if uh, Yamnitzer is com comparing himself uh, to Columbus and his inventions, his etchings, uh, to the inventions uh, of Columbus, I think that is, is really there. What I'm interested in doing is going, taking that a step further and asking what kinds of legal arguments do th then do these images uh, and reports furnish their audiences with, right? And I think when we ask that question, when we, when we think of images as evidence, as building a case, um, as, as making a claim that actually has a legal consequence, right? Um, <laughs> like I keep thinking of, of what is W.H. Auden says, um, Poetry makes nothing happen, right? But um, if you are furnishing, right, uh, but he says it's a way of happening, a mouth. Um, if you are furnishing images and ideas uh, to people who have the, uh, the knowledge and, uh, of complex legal systems, uh, then I think these, these images are very, um, not just dangerous, but, but consequential. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for the splendid lecture. Um, what I like um, to know is whether you are interested uh, also in the destruction of um, the goldsmith's uh, works of art, and especially if so, um, what does this mean for um, the um, <clears throat> different categories of uh, pro uh, uh, um, of property? you try to um, um, categorize. Mm -hmm. So especially those um, kinds who are simply um, changing proprietors or who are, not, um, 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 who are not diminishable and so on. Is it just a reversible uh, process or is there a special, um, um, a special character uh, in this process of destruction? Mm, it's a beautiful question, and um, I, I, I can't answer it without first um, referring to the work of my friend and colleague, Alison Stilo, who wrote a brilliant dissertation on uh, the melting down of metal. So she was, you know, uh, she's, her research is about these things, these objects that don't exist anymore. Uh, and she goes to inventories. And what's, what's so interesting uh, to the historian is that often they're not inventoried until they're about to be melted down so that so that it's actually the destruction gives us the record um, which is quite interesting to think about but to answer your question this I want to I want to you know um, I really think Ali's work is brilliant on this and I want to what I want to do is take it and and argue that that because these metal works were part of the Treasury right in the city of Nuremberg for example Literally, the, the objects, the city would commission every year goldsmiths to make these metal vessels. And that was what the city had in reserve as its funds. They were formed in, as these objects. And they had this reserve so that when dignitaries, diplomats could, would come, they would give these away as gifts. Um, but the, the idea was that they could always be melted down again and used, uh, you know, in times of war for funds. And in fact... This happened to, we know this, I have records of some of Yamnitzer's work, like the dragon you were in um, Dresden that I was showing you. Uh, we, we know, for example, that that came with a, a basin that was melted down, and I can tell you it was melted down exactly uh, in, in the context of the uh, having to pay for the Seven Years' War. Um, uh, what I find so fascinating about this is that, to me, it makes the goldsmith's work precarious in the sense that it always has to, its form always has to defend its value as being higher than its weight, right? That therefore, the form is making the case. It's, it's saying, basically, please don't melt me down, right? Please think of me as more valuable than the coinage that I am worth. 
And the, so the artist's task is to make that argument, right? The artist has to formally make that argument. Um, and, and, and just one more addendum to that idea is that in terms of property, um, uh, metalwork has a very specific, there's actually a specific law um, called specificatio, uh, in, it's a Roman law, about, which asks the question, if somebody makes something from material that is not uh, his own, to whom does it belong? And the answer is, if you, if you steal, you know, your neighbors, if you go around to your neighbors and you steal their, bre uh, their, their flour and their milk and their water and you, and you bake a cake, it's your cake because you can't redistribute the materials. But because uh, gold and silver can always be melted down because of the form, because of that reversibility, it's never really owned by the person who made it. And so that's what I mean by, um, I think, as objects, um, they put their form and they put the artist in this uh, precarious position. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about the size of uh, the new book of grotesques or the role of uh, the German language in these texts? the fonts that are used, anything like that? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, the size of the book uh, is, uh, it's, uh, the, pr the etchings themselves are about this big. Um, and there are several extant copies uh, around the world. Um, there are, uh, there's a, a copy in Wolfenbüttel, which we think uh, is, is the one that has the order. In, there, I mean, there's some question about what order the etchings came in. Uh, the, the example that's here in Berlin has a different order from that Wolfenbüttel uh, book. Um, so we can sort of track these things. In terms of the writing uh, and, the, and the font, so uh, you may have noticed when I showed it to you that, uh, w that as is common in printing at this period, when Jamnitzer reaches for a Latin word, he'll uh, change the font to the Roman font, uh, and, and, and the rest is in, um, is in German. Yeah, a very personal question. Doing such a research, how much knowledge do you have about German? Because when I read most of these, I was more than astonished that you did such a research. Oh, thank, well, uh, let me say that reading reading uh, Yamnister is quite fun because um, he's very playful with language, and, and you saw that poem, right? Um, I tra I translated the whole poem and tried to keep the um, meter and the rhyme scheme, uh, which I have to say was like it was really fun, and maybe it's because it's kind of doggerel and not you know uh, the highest poetry uh, that that I I was able to do this. But you know, to be quite honest with you, I think because uh, I'm working in a a language that's not my own, I have to look everything up. And what I often find is that the meaning of, of a word in uh, early early German was not, uh, you know, the, the meaning I'm familiar with. And so there's a lot of, I think that this makes me very kind of, hopefully makes me sensitive to um, early early usages, and I've, uh, and I've been very intrigued by uh, what, I've, what I've found. But um, I think that, let me just add one more thought to that, which is that, um, that I think a great way to, to train for this project was really to work on Durer, because um, Durer's theoretical treatises, which he, Durer wrote and published in German, he is aiming for a very high theoretical language in a language that is not very sophisticated yet. And um, actually, the, the recent translation in 2017, Jeffrey Ashcroft published a, um, a, a totally new English transla translation into English of all of Durer's Schriftliche Nachas. And he makes this point about German, Durer's German. He says that German would not really become the language of philosophy, of high thinking until the 18th century. And so what we see Durer doing is 
making these like conglomerate words, right? So like the way that Yamnitzer is making these forms by putting uh, words together that don't exist yet. Um, so I, I, you know, I think I think kind of um, cutting one's teeth on Dura is, is a good way to um, to enter into this fascinating turn of the 17th century world. Oh yeah, please give the mic to the lawyer. <laughs> I've been waiting for you. <laughs> no, no, I this, I love this. Thank you so much. Um, I. It's, so I have a very boring, practical lawyer mind, and so I wanted to ask, um, you know, as you for, as 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 the talk unfolded, I assumed that the second aspect of the booklet was like, as you said, bombast. That he was saying, "Oh yes, you know, you in the world can copy my designs," and I assumed that he had no enforceable way to prevent them from mm -hmm. doing so. And in fact, I assumed you know, knowing nothing of intellectual property in this age, um, that that would be a quandary of the medium, right? You're trying to sell your wares, but by doing so, you're kind of putting into the world the possibility that others can copy it. Um, and so I thought, you know, it's just kind of finessing that aspect of it. But then in answer to another question, you talked about the privilege. And so I'm just curious, is he, like, actually, as you said, doing something legal? Like, he's waving... Mm -hmm. A right, like he could have prevented others from mm. copying these designs mm. in some realistic way. I'm so, uh, unfortunately, this is my, my last lecture through the American Academy. But part three <laughs> would would answer your question, Joy. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is another page that follows the rhyme couplet poem where he prints his privilege. He, he receives an imperial privilege for this book, uh, which is good for 15 years. And he, he gives every detail of the privilege. And what's so interesting there is that he says that nobody um, within the bounds of the empire, right, like, I mean who has a map of like what the Holy Roman Empire is in this period? Like it is mm, this elusive thing, right? Um, but anyway, any, anyone who has a, 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 within the bounds of the empire may not copy this book for up to 15 years and that Yamnitzer and his descendants and his heirs, if he, if he is to die within that period, have the right to go anywhere within the empire, track down that copyist, take his goods, I think meaning, you know, take the plates um, as well as the, the, the prints away and confiscate them. Um, and, and then that person is to be fined. So... So what does this mean, that, that that legal apparatus is in place? Well, what it, what it means is that there's a third part to the story, right? Between um, this, this notion of a, a property based on a limited resource like land and the artist's notion um, that ideas are limitless in supply and therefore belong to everybody, there's this third part thing, which is the privilege. And what the privilege does is it appropriates the language of scarcity, right? It, it falsifies scarcity for a temporal period. And then it, and then it you know, re-releases uh, the book. Then anyone can copy it after that, after that moment of time. So it's an adaptation. It's a pretending that the, the resource is scarce so that uh, the artist can profit. What it does not protect, it only protects literally the copying of the book. So it only protects if the actual, every single etching is copied, um, then, then, uh, then this enforcement can be, uh, this restriction can be enforced. Uh, but if, if somebody's taking from the images and, and adapting them, uh, you know, that's, that's totally kosher. Okay. Thank you. If, uh, um, immediately following up on what you were just explaining about, say, copyright control, early forms of copyright control, I was thinking about the uh, the Imperial Council, you, or the the body, the judges, 
to me, it seems to be there's also maybe an alternative history to art criticism there that we haven't been aware of. <laughs> Sounds like an early manifestation of the art critic. But I was wondering, how do they know? What's their basis for judging that something that is submitted is new? I mean, useful, I could say. You could make a pragmatic, say, argument. But how do they know that it's new? Is there an archive they can draw on? Is it not, or who, who is on that, who's part of that body, of that council? Right. That's a great, great question. Um, and, and I think the answer is that they, um, they do archive the submissions. What's interesting is they don't archive the rejections. Um, so the, the books that are rejected, they don't keep. Um, they, they do keep copies of the ones that, that, that are protected. Uh, and so in that sense, yes, there is uh, uh, an archive. But, but they, are, um, they are judges in the sense of they are, they are um, in the position of judging newness. And I should say this, isn't, this doesn't just pertain to, um, to images, but also to in, inventions in, the other, in another sense of um, machines and things like this. Like we have a lot of records about um, those early machines. And what is quite interesting is that in uh, the German context, these laws are initially produced uh, to, to defend the invention of machines for, wait for it, mining. <laughs> so it's, it's the, or we could say that the origins of these laws actually come out of machines that are um, dedicated to profiting from extracting materials from the natural world. And that, to me, when we, when we actually trace that history, right, then I think all of this language about of, an, of analogy between ideas and, and natural resources actually has a, a very traceable um, kind of uh, legal history. Okay. <clears throat> it's actually a remark <clears throat> on that last point. Uh, we should distinguish between the privilege, which is given by the sovereign, and the right. And the right is something which only appears in the 18th century. It's something that you have a claim to, mm -hmm. whereas before it is the sovereign's grace that basically gives you that. And uh, when you said that the privilege is something like a third thing between the infinite uh, flow and uh, the definite scarcity, couldn't you interpret it as a, as a borderline? It's mm -hmm. setting a border between the infinite and the finite, and it determines how long the finite is before the infinite begins. Yes, I think that's a, that's a lovely way of, uh, of thinking of it as a, as a kind of border um, that, is, that is temporal uh, in in and frankly arbitrary, right? Um, in its determination, uh, and I think by paying attention to that, well, what do we what do we gain? We we gain a real understanding of how le legal concepts of property are tied to notions of time, and this is what's so interesting about the Columbus context here is is this question about. Um, you know, that, that Columbus really has to kind of legally describe himself as going back in time. Like how, um, and, and how these um, notions of what is old, what is new, right? The new book of grotesques. And on the, the first title page, Yamnitzer says, new book of tesks, grotesques from an antique temple. So he's found, he, he claims to have discovered, right, going back to Philip's first question about uh, invention and discovery, to have discovered these images in an antique temple and created a new book, right? So we have these um, very complicated notions of time coming together. And I think you're right that um, uh, the privilege is then a, um, an artificial boundary created uh, to, to, to try to uh, enforce protection for, for a limited period. Please. Yes.